everybody. Welcome. Welcome to show 157. Matthew Majinska is here, joined today by Aaron Von Weirdom from Bitcoin Magazine, longtime uh, journalist and uh, editor, technical editor, I believe, from Bitcoin Magazine. Aaron, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, technical editor. I've, I've done a bunch of things over the years. That, that's still my official title. Uh, currently, I'm mostly writing my book. I do a podcast with Shorts as well, uh, Bitcoin Explained. Um, yeah, I was the editor in chief of the print magazine for a while. Not right now, but yeah, I've done I've done a bunch of bunch of st- uh, stuff over the years for Bitcoin Magazine. Yeah, surely, surely our listeners and viewers uh, are aware. Uh, I've loved your stuff a uh, long time over the years. Never had you on the show here. Um, met at a couple conferences over the years in Riga, I think. Uh, met you in Prague. Talked a little bit more, and yeah, glad to have you finally on the show. So, show number one fifty seven is what you said. Yeah. So how long have you been doing this? That, that must have been a while. It's a while, yeah, but it's uh, it's not as hardcore as you know some of the more, let's say, uh, focused Bitcoin shows. Actually, I wanted to ask you from an early guest. I want to ask you my first question because I remember, uh, you know, I like to start with these big picture questions. And I remember uh, we interviewed Eric Voorhees a long, long time ago, uh, mid-2017. And I asked him, Actually, I don't remember what I asked him, but it was just, this was his answer. <laughs> You're really building up the tension. <laughs> uh, his answer, let's say, to this question okay. was, you can explain Bitcoin in the most elegant, uh, technical way possible. You can explain the virtues of it. You can explain sound money. You can explain inflation. You can explain uh, programmable money, these types of things. Uh, but it, in his experience, and this was, you know, he had been in Bitcoin, uh, I think, you know, already for six years or so at the time. Now it's six years later from there. In his experience, when you're talking to the lay person, when you're talking to the average person, you're trying to explain Bitcoin to them. Really, the only thing that gets their attention at the end of the day is price. Uh, mm. what, do you, what do you think about that assessment now, six years, six years later? Uh, I mean, I don't even try to talk to, about Bitcoin to anyone anymore. That's like early days. Yeah, <laughs> that's like early days type of behavior. I'm, I but given but up we're not there, people. man. I I think we we got it. That's what these shows are for. I mean, sure, we have plenty, of, you know, enthusiast people that really care, but uh, we still got to do that, don't we? Well, let's let's be more precise. So I will happily talk about Bitcoin to anyone if they start the conversation. If they want to know about Bitcoin, then I'll be happy to explain anything, answer any questions, whatever they want to talk about, I'm happy to do it. But I'm not going to be the one to bring it up and sort of try to sell it to people. That's year one stuff. And I learned really quickly that that's not real. It's, and I think that's... Um, I think there's actually something kind of profound there. Bitcoin is something you have to discover, is something you have to actually become interested in yourself. I mean, people will hear about it in one way or another, right? Especially these days, because it's just on the news or it's just, it's it's kind of everywhere nowadays. You, you'll hear about it. And then if you're the type of person that's interested in that kind of stuff, you'll actually want to learn more. You will... You will want to know what it is and why it exists and that kind of stuff while trying to push it on people in my experience at least but maybe i'm just a really bad representative in that way but in my experience that never really works people don't want to hear it or hear about it if they don't want to hear about it mm. so i i basically gave up on you know doing the push type of uh um yeah bitcoin sell <laughs> yeah i i was watching uh, a panel uh that you did at bitcoin amsterdam i think it was last year with uh it was on lightning sergey was there sergey codler he's been on the show a couple times like him a lot like his approach would like what they're doing at bit refill and he said you know you have the uh masses that we want to use bitcoin and even the masses that are using bitcoin right now but they don't love Bitcoin, right? They don't, they, don't, they don't think about its features like we think about it. They don't think about its potential like we think about it. They're just using it to, you know, in the early days, might have been to buy drugs or now it's just to buy gift cards and bit refill, which is his 
course, experience, and he's uh, well versed at that. Uh, the people that come to conferences, the people who come to Bitcoin Miami, Bitcoin Amsterdam, they're the ones that love Bitcoin, love the features, and we can really uh, sell them on those things. But it's kind of another way of phrasing, I think, my first question, right? It's like, how do you get the people that don't love Bitcoin, don't care at all to use it, to want to use it, to sort of want to get other people to use it? Yeah, well, I mean, his point is also, I think there's just people that need Bitcoin. They don't care mm. what it is. It's just the only option they have available for them. That's actually a much bigger group than indeed the conference goers. But but that's a slightly different point, I would say. I, I think that's also very true. And that's uh, something we should keep in mind. But yeah, for me, like as a journalist, for example, when I just discovered Bitcoin, uh, I was doing an internship at, at a sort of general news magazine in the Netherlands. And my sort of first idea was I want to write about this stuff. I'm going to, you know, explain to a general audience what Bitcoin is or why it is important. And and I really quickly found that that's because I reached out to different like newspapers, magazines and publications that I thought were interested and might be interested in this. And I found very quickly that there was very little appetite for that. So while actually writing for a Bitcoin audience, so for Bitcoin Magazine, and before that I wrote for a couple of other publications. I did some work for Coindesk and Cointelegraph. And that's actually much more interesting to me. You're writing for people that are already interested in this stuff. That way you can also go way more in depth and it's a much more thankful job in a way. People actually want to know what this is and how it works and what's going on. As opposed to, yeah, trying to sell it to an audience that, for the most part, just doesn't really care. I, yeah, I, I gave up on that pretty quickly. Yeah. Do you think that uh, Bitcoin has the potential to be uh, worldwide global money? Or do you think it might be uh, just like kind of an asset that people hold and some people use for payments? Or do you have an opinion? I, I think it has the potential, but I wouldn't... Uh, dare to put it like a time frame on that. I don't know yeah. if it's going to be, you know, a 10 year thing, which it's probably going to be more than a 10 year thing, I think, at, at least like that's the year thing, maybe. Yeah, I agree. Right, exactly. Maybe uh, not even in our lifetimes thing. That's possible. I, it took the printing press a long time be to, to go mainstream, to, you know, in part because uh, the elites didn't like it for a long time. So something like that, that's a potential future that Bitcoin's just going to be there for, you know, a sort of niche or it could be a big niche, but could be a dark market kind of currency. But before it's actually going mainstream could be, you know, beyond our lifetimes possibly, or it could be within our lifetimes. But I, I think in general, it has the potential. In general, I think the idea is that that's sort of the ultimate goal. Uh, hyper Bitcoinization, at least in the long run, is something that's possible and we should work towards, we should think about how we're gonna make that possible on a technical level, for example. So I do see that as the end, end goal. I, I don't, however, think Bitcoin is a failure if we don't get there within 10 or 20 or even 30 or 40 years. As long as Bitcoin exists, it's, it's kind of awesome in itself. Yeah, I don't see it as a failure either. Do you think there are some groups of Bitcoiners that do? Or at least they delude themselves if, you know, we're not uh, at hyper Bitcoinization in five years. That might be unfair to them, but I don't know. I mean, possibly there's Bitcoiners with all kinds of opinions. I was thinking more in line of, you know, mainstream publications, kind of uh, narratives that, that, you know, Bitcoin has died uh, 150 times or whatever it is by now. Mm. Like any time where we hit a new bear market, the the new narrative is that Bitcoin has somehow failed. So that 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 I would definitely reject as long as Bitcoin is actually working, as long as there's blocks, as long as people are using it. I don't think you can reasonably call it a failure, even if we haven't reached hyper Bitcoinization without X number of years. Um, and, you know, insofar there are Bitcoiners that think that right now, their opinions might change. But again, when I just got into Bitcoin, I also had a over optimistic idea i i really believed in hyper bitcoinization within like when i first discovered bitcoin i thought this was this, this is going to be a thing within a couple of years <laughs> really this is at, at first i mean yeah at first when i like i'm talking 
about like the first couple of months when I discovered it, mm. some, you know, around that time. And we were in a bull market and it sort of all started to click for me. I figured this is just going to be something like as soon as people hear about this, they're going to understand it and they're going to use it and they're going to see why this is better than fiat and they're, and this is going to be like a super rapid thing. Well, I had to adjust my expectations, uh, which, uh, you know, it's fine. I don't, I, like I said, I don't think it's a failure. It, I was just hyper or over optimistic in the first phase of my Bitcoin life. And, you know, people can adjust their opinions. Yeah, of course. It's uh, totally reasonable. And I think, um, you know, it, I've said it, I remember saying this six years ago, it's like Bitcoin still probably means a lot of things to a lot of people. And uh, that's great. That's great. There's probably no, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing, right? So even before Bitcoin, I think it was Peter Weiler who once formulated, I mean, I'm sure many people have said something similar, but Bitcoin is sort of useful at any scale. Like it's it's useful if, it, if we live in a hyper Bitcoinized world, but it's also useful in sort of every stage that comes before that, whether it's useful as you know, at a dark net market kind of currency, or it's useful as a gold-like store of value that's not used in daily life, but it's used by some people to store their value. And, and for every step along the way towards hyper-Bitcoinization, it's useful for a group of people, which makes hyper-Bitcoinization itself a more plausible prospect. Like if we would have to go from zero to hyper Bitcoinization and in between Bitcoin doesn't actually do anything, then it's really hard to get from zero to everything. But because yeah. it's it's useful on any scale, it's actually quite reasonable to think that we might actually get to hyper Bitcoinization eventually. Yeah. There's a lot of problems to be solved before we can actually make it happen. I'm now talking about a technical a technical level, but it's it's a very plausible endpoint, I think, because of that. Yeah, it's another thing that Sergey said in that interview I was just thinking of it's the champagne problems right it's like you scale to something you have more problems pop the champagne enjoy the uh achievement enjoy the problems that you're faced with and then solve the next problem so that's, that's right probably a good way to look at it let me ask you about uh cash physical cash we talked about this a little right. bit in Prague. yep um physical cash is actually on the rise yeah, you told me that I was, was that was you. surprising to me. Yeah, yeah. I'll rephrase it. I do some videos on this as well, you know, for the listener of you or on YouTube. But so the physical cash stock actually grows at ten and a half percent per year, a little bit less now, maybe ten point four. Um, that is down. For, that that rate of change is down from like thirty years ago. It was like maybe twelve, thirteen percent, but it's up from like fifty years ago, just after the end of the gold standard, where maybe physical cash was growing five, six percent. So now physical physical cash grows at ten and a half percent per year, whereas population people grow at one point five percent per year. So that is a rate of change that is seven times higher. Uh, the the supply, let's say, is seven times higher than the, the demand. Which is so is this worldwide cash, or are you talking worldwide? About this? Yep, dollars, worldwide. euros, yen. Right. I've actually, okay. and this is actually some research that I'll be doing with the just another shameless plug. Uh, People probably know the Human Rights Foundation. We're doing a CBDC tracker. We're going to be launching a CBDC tracker with the Human Rights Foundation at the end of the year. So this will be part of it. But it's just numbers I kind of know off the top of my head. So physical cash is actually growing. Um, even though people say it's like not used and people say we need the CBDC but and everything. Is this, is this true across the board? Is it more true? It's probably more true for some fiat currencies than for others, but is it, it's true for basically every fiat currency at, to some extent? Yeah. Across the board, uh, the only two that uh, buck the trend are our Scandic friends in Sweden and Norway. They are famously trying to really right. go cashless and they actually are. Uh, but even in the last few years, like Sweden, is a very if you watch the physical cash the trend it's hilarious it's like this and then you know it's like a for the listeners it's like a downward sloping curve and then it's a little bit in the last couple of years they they can't help but print some more it's interesting especially with covid uh even though they're saying like we need to go digital and everything with covid they actually are printing more you know i, I don't know if it's part of some stimulus or whatever uh, i don't know 
people take stimulus checks or stimulus deposits and turn them into cash. But they, but they, they actually, even in Sweden and Norway, they're kind of struggling to completely go down. But just to answer your question, it's obviously way up in like, you know, Mexico, uh, Argentina, Turkey. Uh, uh, those are just always, always way up. Argentina is crazy, obviously, this year. It's standard in the US, the Eurozone, but there's only two countries where they kind of are trying to not do that. And that's Sweden and Norway. Right. And in this context, when you say print more, it probably literally means print more. I'm literally talking about the physical cash. Stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's about. I mean, there are, there's still a difference between whether it's print, like already in bank faults because you're talking about in circulation, I would assume. Correct. Yeah. There's. Uh, what you, this is the as I phrase it the currency in circulation, which is uh, one of the two main monetary liabilities of the central bank. Uh, the other is what they call the bank reserve, uh, and that is the by and large the majority of what those total the to, the total of those two things is the monetary base. So the bank reserves plus the physical cash, the monetary base, and uh, that's basically the amount of liabilities that the central bank print out to the society. Right. Well, my question was more specifically. So a banknote can be either in a bank or in someone's wallet, right? Or under someone's mattress, like a, a banknote can still be not in circulation. No, it's, it's, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, that, that good question. It's about 10 per, actually, I don't have a full answer on, on the percentage there, but that five to 10%, it's a minority that is in the bank vaults, actually in the safes of banks. That is included in the number that I'm using because it's outside of the central bank. So once it goes outside the central bank, even if it goes into a commercial bank, it's it's in society. And right. those can be used to, to do other loans and that affects the bank's balance sheets and everything. It's part of society, even if it's in a under a mattress or in a grocery store till or in a bank vault. So that is that in that is that is defined as currency in circulation, even if it's in a bank vault. Got it. So then I guess an obvious next question is, do, why is this? Do you have an explanation for this? Why is it growing? I think they just uh, don't have any other tool other than to print. Um, right, but they can print digitally. So, uh, so the question is, why is it specifically physical cash that's increasing? Well, the digital actually is, uh, we flipped the interview. Huh? It's now you yes. asking me questions. It's good. It's, it's fine. <laughs> well, I'm more this used is, to that. This is a topic I like anyway. Um, the uh the bank reserve portion as you know interest rates have been rising around like the western world here the bank reserve portion that i mentioned before which is 70 percent of the central bank balance sheet okay so let's put it in let's use numbers it's 30 trillion roughly is monetary base 30 trillion dollar equivalent and when i say 30 trillion dollars that means euros yen yuan uh argentinian pesos um you know chilean chilean pesos every every currency so it's about 30 trillion it's down now to 27 trillion. So it was, let's say a year, two years ago, let's say it was 30 trillion. Now it's down to 27 trillion. And that is a result of their uh, interest rate hikes. They actually mm -hmm. decrease the amount of reserves that banks hold. And then that decreases lending that raises interest rates, all those things. That's actually the technical sort of mechanic that they do that. But of the 30 trillion, roughly, let's say now it's 27 trillion, but of the 27 trillion, only 9 trillion of it is physical cash. And then nine trillion, just interestingly, which a lot of people don't talk about. This is why I always joke about CBDC versus CBPC, central bank physical currency. Everybody's all, you know, a thousand and one papers are written about CBDCs, but no one talks about CBPC. And it's just like steadily trucking along at 10 and a half percent per year. And I think that's huge. I mean, because this, all of it, the whole thing we've been talking about, by the way, and the reason I brought it up to you is like, this is the money that is comparable to Bitcoin central bank money, you know, it is, that is the core basic money of the system. You mm -hmm. know, your bank deposit is actually not comparable to Bitcoin. It's, it's, uh, you know, that's a, that's an exchange account. It's a Coinbase account. It's, a, it's just not a Coinbase can hold Bitcoin. But when you see Bitcoin on your screen in your dashboard as a Coinbase uh, depositor, you do not have that Bitcoin. Coinbase has the Bitcoin, you have the deposit, you have the claim. So anyway, that's a, but the point, the point is, you know, that uh, $9 trillion or so of cash is like what everybody thinks is his real money. Bitcoin is obviously taking a big chunk of that. Bitcoin is 500 billion, um, you know, equivalent. And 
that money just keeps on printing every every year at ten and a half percent. So I just think that's interesting. I think that a lot of people don't think about it. I think they talk about all this stuff, CBDCs. They think they just distract us from a reality that has not changed. And uh, those are fifty year numbers. I'm telling you, by the way. Like so so I, you know, literally, the, the population of the world has doubled once over the last fifty years, whereas physical cash money has doubled every seven years over the last 50 years. Yeah, I mean, I would have expected base money to have been growing in, in this kind of rates, but I had not expected physical mm. cash to be growing because like when I look around me, clearly physical cash is going out of fashion. I, I mean, I have friends that don't even use wallets anymore because they don't use physical cash. They just mm. carry it around their phone or their car. And I mean, the Netherlands is kind of following in you know Sweden's footsteps in that sense. We're probably a little bit behind still. Or behind, in a good way, I would say. I like physical cash, but um, so I'm I'm surprised at the physical cash. I'm I'm specifically surprised by that number. That that's counterintuitive to me. So I'm wondering if that's just people taking their money out of banks, or like you say, it's it's just part of the increase of the base money and physical cash is part of that. The thing that really affects interest rates, the thing that affects the economy more, no doubt, is that bank reserve portion. It's what the banks can work with. It's mm -hmm. more of the, uh, let's say, the 20 trillion versus the 10, the 9 or 10, which is physical cash, the 30 trillion that makes up the total monetary base. I think that that's something that will have to come to the fore because, you know, even during this time where the uh, balance sheets of central banks around the world have been falling, and we'll see how long this interest rate pain can, can last. You know, I mean, people are getting hurt on their mortgages and car payments and everything else, and let alone broader economy problems for broader companies. But, uh, you know, all during that time, there's still going to be printing money. Like it's not, you, you, when you look at a balance sheet, even if you see like, oh, because people try to say like, oh, let's get back to normal times. Let's shrink the balance sheet, all this stuff with the central banks. But they, nobody mentions the fact that, that that cash just keeps riveting up there. And um, I just think it's something that should be pointed out more. But I think it's part of their, operations right they just don't like to they don't like to highlight these things and they'd rather talk about cbdc's and something magical and something that will change uh you know but and i agree with you by the way cash is a good thing but bitcoin's better so <laughs> i mean is bitcoin better when it comes to privacy i would say no i hope we'll get there but right now cash is definitely still more private uh, so Bitcoin's goal is to become that i, I would say we're not quite there yet i, I mean bitcoin is cash for the internet it's the best cash we have for the internet i would say but if it comes to physical transactions in person transactions and if you really want to be private you know cash is still better in that sense buying bitcoin with cash is even better than that i mean that's that's <laughs> the best way to get bitcoin for sure yeah if, if you want yeah. to do it privately which is another reason why we shouldn't get rid of cash just, just mm -hmm. that reason alone it, it's a way to get bitcoin anonymously 100%, 100% agree. Do you uh, do you see anything or welling coming with that? I don't know. You have any thoughts on Mika or uh, again all the CBDC chat? Are you worried about it? Um, I I mean CBDCs can be implemented in different ways, as I'm sure you know. And I think some ways that it can be implemented aren't necessarily worse than we what we have right now that most people use right now. Like if most people are going to use you know, bank transfers, bank accounts, PayPal, then CBDCs aren't necessarily worse. And maybe depending on how they're implemented, they might even be better. Like there's very private ways of implementing CBDCs. And in that way, you don't have the bank risk. And you do get, you know, Xiaomi in privacy, for example. So I don't think that's necessarily a step back. Forget about Bitcoin for a second, right? I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm, I'm a Bitcoiner. I like Bitcoin. But if we forget about Bitcoin for a second, then you, if you just compare CBDCs sort of in the best case scenario, in the best way that they could potentially be implemented, then I would say it's actually a pretty big step forwards compared to using commercial banks for all your transactions and, um, you know, risking losing your money if the bank goes down, goes bankrupt, if you have too much. And so it's potentially a step forward however it's also potentially the worst possible 
money we could ever see that that's <laughs> completely controlled by a central party and completely monitored and can com- be completely censored sort of the type of cbdc that we i think are seeing in china like that's so, so that's the worst case scenario but um i don't think i see cbdc necessarily as sort of this boogeyman that it's sometimes presented as i i think there are ways of implementing it that are reasonable and maybe a step forward. Did you follow what happened in Nigeria when they rolled out the e Naira? Uh, remi- remind me. They tried to like outlaw all, not just Bitcoin, but all crypto, and they started it. And then there was such an out, outcry and nobody was using it yet. E Naira, they both rolled back that law and um, the e Naira didn't really work anyway. And there's much more of a regional sort of implementation now. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not. An expert on it yet but uh one other interesting thing actually back to our prior discussion the physical cash of nigeria did fall a little bit and then now it's <laughs> it's dipping back up again it's growing again uh which is interesting right well that is an interesting point you you bring up is one potential risk or problems with cbdc's is that it could be presented as sort of an alternative to Bitcoin and therefore we don't need Bitcoin and therefore now we can ban it sort of that, that Mm. that's like a very viable narrative that you could see central banks or governments put forward. Right. Like why would you even need Bitcoin? And now it's only for criminals because if you want to use, I don't know, programmable money or any of the other use cases that are sort of being promoted as a big benefit of Bitcoin, especially if you don't want to mention dark, dark net markets or inflation, then CBDCs can be promo- can be put forward as an alternative and sort of an excuse to ban Bitcoin. To be clear, I don't. Well, you can ban Bitcoin. Uh, uh, you. Well, you know what I'm saying. So it can be put forward in a narrative that's bad for Bitcoin. To follow up on that other thought, so people like to say you can't ban Bitcoin. I reject that idea. Like you clearly can ban Bitcoin. You you can make it illegal. Now you can't stop people from using it maybe like we can maybe make the technology good enough that you can always use it but that would still not be a world that i would be happy with like i i would prefer it if it's not illegal i would prefer it if you don't go to jail for using bitcoin you know which is a potential dystopian future so i do think it would be better if we can make sure that it's not banned one of the ways to make sure it's not banned is to make sure it's available and it's sort of very hard to stop anyways. But beyond that, I also think it's important that a narrative of, you know, it's it's a human right, it's something we should be allowed to use is also important. So CBDCs can potentially sort of disrupt that message, potentially depending on what message we put forward about Bitcoin. So, the, you know, one of the, this is why I brought up earlier, I think this is especially something we saw earlier in Bitcoin's lifetime, maybe not so much nowadays, but you had sort of a lot of whitewashing type of narrative around Bitcoin. Like, no, no, it's not for dark net markets and it's not just for these gold box. It's it's a super innovative thing. We can make self-driving cars that will accept Bitcoin and it's super useful and in technological innovation. Yay. Now that's kind of true, but all these things can actually be copied by a CBDC or by some other electronic currency while the fundamental properties of bitcoin that we might care about more or that i care about more like censorship resistance and inflation resistance we shouldn't pretend like that's not the main thing or that's not important no that is important and the narrative should be that that's something we should be allowed to use and that's uh, that so, so that's why i'm Okay. Yes. You get my point, right? Yeah. But (laughs) so you're worried. Am I worried? Um, No, like I said, I think this is more something that we saw in the early days of Bitcoin. I think that has sort of shifted. I do think the narrative today is more uh, closer to what the actual benefits of Bitcoin are. And uh, you mean the narrative from big governments or? trying to frame that that way or i mean even that i would say even even politicians if they talk about bitcoin they they don't necessarily talk about self-driving cars right um yeah so yeah i think that the two big 
benefits of Bitcoin are censorship resistance and inflation resistance, and we shouldn't try to pretend otherwise. But again, I don't think that's happening that much anymore. That's that's more of an early day Bitcoin kind of thing. And um, that does mean that, you know, criminals can use it as well. That's they, they get to benefit from censorship resistance. We shouldn't pretend otherwise. In, you know, in the same way they can use cash today, they can use Bitcoin. That's just a a risk or a downside that we have to accept. That's a part of privacy that we have to accept. And I, I think that should be a narrative. But I think that is more or less a narrative these days. So it's not it's not a concern I really have. Interesting. Yeah, that's ah, all related. I mean, everything we've talked about, I mean, even back to the beginning about, you know, who must use it, who needs to use it. I mean, obviously, Bitcoin will uh, be around, as we said, uh, we believe and should be based on the technical uh, parameters of the protocol. But I mean, there are there are failure modes, I would say. I don't I don't see Bitcoin as a fate accompli necessarily. There are ways it could fail. But as long as it doesn't, I think it's a success in a, in a way, at least. But what you said about banning is, I think, relevant. And uh, I don't see us going, you know, in the West, going the way of China. But, um, you know, are you worried about even some bad politicians making the same mistake in Europe? I wouldn't say I'm worried about it. I, I just see it as a potential future. Uh, I, don't, I don't spend my time worrying about it actively. Uh, but, yeah. uh, you know, it's something that, that could happen, I suppose. I don't think uh, I see like a near term, very concrete move in that direction. And I think the idea of being able to use your money of choice is kind of a very, you know, almost obvious idea that I think is compelling. And it's sort of hard to argue about that. But who knows? Uh, it, it, it's it's definitely possible. It's definitely possible that the sort of winds will change and the tide will turn against Bitcoin in the sort of in the public debate. Maybe especially as it, well, especially as it grows larger. Although, if it grows larger, that also means adoption increases and more people will probably be against the ban. So I'm not, especially in sort of you know democratic countries, I'm probably less worried about that. So in Europe, for example. But it's possible and it's something we should keep in mind and kind of keep it. That's something Bitcoin should ultimately be designed for, that even if it is banned, people should still be able to use it because it's not, you can't stop people from using it. That's, that's the, ultimately the goal, right? What about privacy? Uh, not, let's not go in necessarily all the technical uh, details of what Bitcoin can and can't do. But uh, again, backing out, I watched an interview that you did with the Monero uh, guy uh like four years ago five years that's, ago that's that's a while ago that's probably t six years ago if, yeah five or six yeah it was after uh the all the scaling wars had ended about a year after i think it was the end 2018 so yeah five five uh years ago i do remember this article as well i think it was a series of articles you were it analyzing was... different privacy coins yeah uh, i did like five or something that's right yeah, and you analyzed those as well on this show, which is one I would I just watched recently. Um, it's interesting though, just to talk about like you know Grin and Beam and these ones. Like these coins are just completely dead. Oh wow, yeah, I didn't even remember these, but yeah, these ex these existed. I mean, they might still exist. I looked them up prior to the show. They have, but you know, these are coins that during the you know even post ICO stuff, post all the other altcoin booms. Like these are coins that in the last five years, let's say they did trade as high as a couple bucks or, uh, let's say high, you know, I don't know, 50, 70 cents or something, or a couple bucks or 10 bucks. And now a bunch of them are like, you know, one cent, two cent price. Yeah. I do think that's kind of surprising. Like if I would have sort of had to make a guess, you know, five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, early on, then my guess would have probably been that Bitcoin's biggest competitors would be like privacy coins that offer better privacy. But they're basically nowhere to be seen in the charts. Like you have to go down to what, like except for Monero. Interesting. Well, but that's even Monero's like what twentieth or so. Is it in the top ten? Probably not. I think probably not. No. So that so I think that's surprising that these coins aren't higher because that's a real use case that I would have expected to actually draw some, you know, viable market share. 
while right now I think the top ten is just full of garbage, basically, right? There's is there anything? Well, there's some stables. Oh yeah, I mean I don't even really count these, but yeah, there's stable. I mean it's I guess half of the top ten are stable coins. From a monetary perspective, they're not at all like what the, the f- fulfilling what Bitcoin does. Yes. Um. Yeah, Bitcoin still seeks privacy. We have many ways. We have many wallets that offer privacy solutions, mixing solutions. Uh, and there's been a lot of improvement there over the years. Taproot, of course, was a major upgrade as well, which offers more. Um, you know, pieces of that can offer more privacy in, in transactions. Are you surprised that people aren't thinking about it as much? It kind of goes back to what I said before, like maybe just want people want Bitcoin to be an asset and they're not thinking about it in their monetary transactions. Uh, I think that's part of it. I also think Bitcoin is probably private enough for sort of to the extent that people care about it. Uh, I think most people don't care about privacy that much. Like they still maybe want to buy drugs online, but for them, then Bitcoin is sort of private enough. So they don't need to go to altcoins that, that offer even more privacy. Like it's the, the odds of, uh, you know, feds busting your door in for buying a gram of wheat or whatever it is, is, is pretty slim. So I, I do think people use Bitcoin for privacy purposes. And I think it's just probably private enough for most use cases in that sense. So un, until feds actually do start you know, busting people's doors in for buying some LSD or whatever it is, then then people are just going to be fine with Bitcoin. Like they can't use PayPal or bank transfers, obviously. That's clearly not private enough. That will be blocked. But Bitcoin still works, so it's good enough. So they don't need to actually go to Zcash or Monero. I think that's a, that's part of it. Our questions are starting to be interrelated. Like, you know, if privacy doesn't matter, then... Maybe some other things don't matter about Bitcoin and then maybe CBDCs are just fine. It's not just drugs. Uh, that's just sort of an obvious example that I use, although I do think that's part of it. Uh, I, WikiLeaks is another very obvious example. You know, WikiLeaks was essentially saved by Bitcoin because every other payment processor blocked them and uh, Bitcoin was not blocked. And again, even though Bitcoin's privacy is not perfect, in fact, you could argue especially back then, Bitcoin's privacy was pretty bad. You know, this is going back to 2011. This is probably before coin joints were even invented. It was still good enough for that use case. So if it's good enough, you know, if, it, if I can donate money to Bit, to WikiLeaks using Bitcoin because it's private enough for that, and censorship resistant enough for that, and I don't expect feds to bust down my door because I'm donating money to WikiLeaks, then I don't need to go to Monero or I don't need to go to Zcash, even though technically maybe they offer more privacy. But I don't need to go there. I can still just use Bitcoin. It's it's good enough, right? That's interesting. This is a little bit of a different tone, though, than that five-year-ago interview, obviously. I don't remember that interview, obviously. Like, it's five years ago. I haven't rewatched it. Let me tell you the tone of it. The tone of okay. it was, was regardless of what some of the other privacy coins are doing, of course the goal should always be to improve Bitcoin. So, and, and we want to improve Bitcoin and Bitcoin has the capability to be improved to add, you know, something that is uh, maybe not as perfectly technical as some of these others, but certainly good enough to do privacy. Now you did use the words good enough here, but I think you were, you were meaning a bit more five years ago. Like it's not just about what Bitcoin can do right now. And if the feds will bust your door in for a transaction i think we we probably still can do much more on bitcoin right and uh but i guess my question still is do you think that that's a a glaring need right now in in the bitcoin world or is it uh people are not as much focused on it okay yeah so don't get me wrong i i think bitcoin privacy should be as good as we can make it like ideally we'd have perfect privacy ideally it would be like physical cash like i mentioned earlier my answer before was I was just sort of thinking out loud trying to explain why privacy coins aren't more popular right now. So And so I think right now Bitcoin is probably private enough that people don't need to go to privacy coins. Now, will that be true tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe not. And it's good to work to, to make sure that it is if that's needed. So I'm completely on board with making Bitcoin 
as privacy as it can be, or as private as it can be, as private as Zcash or whatever the best private technology is. But it's probably Zcash, I would I would say. Um, it has other downsides, obviously, which we don't need to get into. But Bitcoin should be as private as possible. I just think private coins aren't more popular than they are because Bitcoin's probably private enough for most use cases today. That's that's sort of my out loud thinking. It's interesting to look back, you know, over five, six years and see how things have uh, changed because we all thought that that was maybe a glaring need five, six years ago. And, and who knows, maybe it will be a glaring need five, six years from now. But I mean, maybe it is, maybe it is today, right? Maybe, like, maybe it's a glaring need in China, for example, right now. And, and we're not offering them enough, if you want to talk, speak about it like that. Like maybe a lot more people in countries like China would be using Bitcoin if it was more private and even more censorship resistant, possibly. We don't know, so it's good to at least try to make it as private as we can. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, my answer, I guess, was considering it from a Western perspective. I should check my financial privilege. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... Uh... You're answering from your perspective for sure, which is all uh, all I'm asking for this app. So that's great. What next? How about uh, Bitcoin Amsterdam coming up again very soon in October? Uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, second edition. Uh, so yeah, we've uh, we're we're getting ready. I'm not on the organizing team or anything. I, but um, you know, I I I do see what they're working on, and it looks like it's gonna be another pretty it's a pretty spectacularly produced conference it's really cool because uh, so the the week after bitcoin amsterdam there's going to be amsterdam dance event which is like a big international electronic music conference festival sort of all throughout the city and so one of the big events is going to be in the same venue as bitcoin amsterdam so what they're doing is they're getting all the sort of lights for this big techno party and like it's it's all going to be used by our conference so it's i would say it's probably the best looking bitcoin conference in the world that's fantastic yeah it's it's pretty spectacular i mean last year as well but i think they're going to outdo it this year uh it's also just the venue itself it's this old sort of factory environment uh, old gas factory or some something of that so it has this very industrial feel and then with the yeah with all the lights and the big screens it's it's a like the production value is i would i mean i would say i'm biased but i would actually say it's probably the best looking bitcoin conference in the world just as it comes to production value wow and amazing uh, yeah we good good speakers as well so yeah i'm looking forward to it it's gonna be another good one i think it's kind of a home game for me, so that's always fun. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, for sure. You guys do a great job. I mean, ever since reviving the you know the 2013 conference in Miami a few years ago, like it's just you guys have been on point for sure. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Let's talk about your book a little bit. It's 12 and 13, I think. All right. I just looked it up. Uh, yeah, my book. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, what's it about, and how far is it uh, from being released? So, yeah, uh, the book is called The Genesis Book. It's about the prehistory of Bitcoin. I, I would say it's really about Bitcoin. Like, it's a book about Bitcoin. And there's, of course, different ways of explaining Bitcoin, different perspectives to explain it from. And I'm explaining it from a historical perspective. I am technically a historian. That's what I went to university for. None of that matters, but, you know, maybe that's... Uh, I went back to the prehistory of Bitcoin, so that's... Uh, diving deep into sort of Austrian economics, where that came from, uh, cryptography, the invention of public key cr cryptography, and sort of the hacker culture, and, and and sort of tell the story from there, kind of step to step, step by step of how we got closer and closer to Bitcoin. So at some point, we meet the cypherpunks and the digital projects they were working on, and how they were, you know, the problems they were struggling with, the challenges they had and um, how Bitcoin sort of evolved over time before Bitcoin itself existed. So the the mythos, I, I think the mythos is kind of dead by now, the, or at least 
some people might still think this, but definitely a couple of years ago, there was this sense that there was nothing. And then Satoshi appeared from the heavens and he dropped Bitcoin on earth. And now we had Bitcoin. Immaculate conception. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's some truth to that. Like Satoshi came from nowhere, or at least we don't know what it is to put it that way. He probably didn't literally come from nowhere. He probably didn't literally come from the heavens is my guess. <laughs> but Bitcoin itself, <laughs> but Bitcoin itself certainly didn't come out of nowhere. If you look at the attempts to create digital cash, you can really clearly see, I think, a progression towards Bitcoin. One thing, one invention led to the next, like hash cash led to Bitgold, led to B-Money, led to... So you got the whole sort of process. And I think sort of understanding this process is a really good way of actually understanding Bitcoin itself. So to ex ex understand how why Bitcoin was designed, how it was designed, why it was designed the way that it was, and when, it's really good to go back into this history because it's sort of really explains this step for step or at least that's what i'm trying so that's that's the book i'm writing I, it's almost done at this point so i open sourced it i i put it out there so it is actually available to read online if you go to the genesisbook.com you will find the google drive and all the chapters are there and it will be an actual book within a couple of months from now so it's it's i'm in the late stages of writing and editing and sort of finishing the whole process and then it will be done are you actually writing it on google docs live while it's in there the google drive or at this point yeah i i wrote a you know, earlier drafts i wrote you know my own computer but at some point i did put it out there and since then i have been, yeah people could see me live editing if they want to they could actually go to <laughs> and see me see me write the book yeah <laughs> oh you're definitely getting on the open source ethos uh, yourself with that I mean, I kind of had to, I think, because that's also a big part of the book itself. Like that's one of the sort of storylines, one of the narratives in the book itself is the emergence of free and open source software and where that came from and why that makes sense. It's also why that makes sense for Bitcoin. And at some point I came to the realization that it's almost weird to not actually apply that same logic to my own work. I kind of have to logically... If, if I'm making the case that that's the best way to do something, then I should be doing it like that, right? And I do think it's been an interesting experiment. I, I did, you know, it is kind of an experiment. It is an interesting way of doing something, just kind of collecting feedback from everyone um, because, you know, people might have specific knowledge or something that, that I missed, and that has happened. Like, people have given interesting feedback on like kind of niche topics that I, uh, that I was aware, unaware of. Um, and that, that helps me improve the book. So they work out in that way. And, um, it, it, but yeah, I, at this point it's, I mean, I'm kind of done. I'm really close to being done. So it's exciting to be able to publish my first book soonish. Oh, congrats. Now, I love that history, man. And uh, again, kind of circling back to what we were already discussing, you know, like you said, it's not a fait accompli. I completely agree. I just find it hard to believe that there could be anything other than Bitcoin that would win, uh, even in a world of CBDCs or, uh, you know, the major big boss of, of fiat money that we have to compete with. Well, very good stuff. Uh, listen, as we close it then, uh, where can our listeners find out more about you and what you're doing well i guess i'm still on twitter or at least i still have an account uh so you can find me there and then if you find me there then you can also find my nostr pop key just in my account description my twitter account is at aaron van w um i guess there's no real good alternative other than that right so that would probably be the way to go still and bitcoin magazine of course uh, well, I haven't written for Bitcoin Magazine for a while because I'm working on my book, but eventually, probably. And also my podcast with Shores, which is called Bitcoin Explained, we topic, uh, where we tackle uh, 
one specific technical topic of Bitcoin every other week. Aaron, well, listen, thanks a lot for joining. I enjoyed the chat today and uh, best of luck launching your book. Thanks. Thanks for having me.